Hello and welcome to today's World Skills webinar. This session will cover how students can prepare themselves and their mindset for high pressured environments such as exams and endpoint assessments and also cover how educators can support them in preparing. If you haven't already done so, please put something into the chat box to let me know you can hear me okay. You'll find this at the bottom of your webinar control panel at the right hand side of your screen. We do encourage questions, so please add them to your chat box. No question is a silly question. The session will be recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube channel afterwards. So my name is Rachel Webster and I'm starting this session. I'm one of NCFA's curriculum development officers and I'm responsible for supporting the teaching and learning of the digital T-level. We are also joined today by Helen, one of my provider development colleagues, and she's responsible for the education and childcare T-level. And our role is to support T-level centres through the planning, onboarding and CPD processes for NCFE cash qualifications, with a focus on promoting and advancing learning. We will be monitoring the um, chat box today. Now, NCFE are delighted to be working collaboratively with the World Skills UK Centre of Excellence to offer centre staff an opportunity to learn from the experiences and approaches developed by the World Skills coaches who are acknowledged as expert practitioners in their field. <clears throat> In today's session, we'll also be completing activities such as polls and the sharing of questions and ideas in the chat box. Please do remember to use the chat box throughout the webinar whenever your question arises. Okay, before we hand over to World Skills, um, we're going to start with a poll. And I'm just going to launch that poll now. So how familiar are you with training students and apprentices on their mindset to influence their standards and performance? We've got some coming in, we're nearly there. We're at about 75%. I'll just give you a few more seconds. Okay, so the poll shown that 20%, oh, it's just changed, 17% are extremely familiar, and 17% are very familiar, 50% in the middle, quite familiar, and a further 17% unfamiliar. Thank you very much for that. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Stephanie Tibbet. Thank you, Rachel. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Dr. Steph Tibbet. Um, I'm a chartered psychologist and I work mostly in the performance domains. So if I can give you a little bit of background about myself uh, and my involvement with world skills. So I've been a chartered psychologist for a number of years and I've worked in various domains. So I spent a number of years out in Australia working in Australian football, working on pressure and performance and how to perform at the big matches. And then I spent a number of years working in music in Shanghai, working with Shanghai Orchestra Academy and working with musicians and in some cases dancers to work on their performance anxiety, to work on how they might manage different uh, environments and still be able to perform at their highest level. And what we tended to find was there are certain strategies that can be useful, but I think it's really important to recognize that performance and mindset and the psychology of performance, it's an art. So not that one size fits all, but that we have to really understand what that individual is thinking and feeling in some cases for us to be able to help the individual. So that's why for this session today, we've really thought about 
how do we give some skills, but we have to give some of the grounding and the background and the psychology first too. So now I'm back in the UK and I'm working with World Skills, which I think most of you are quite familiar with, but World Skills are an organisation who develop apprentices who then go on to compete in a two yearly competition in their skills and trades against the rest of the world. And my job within that environment is for me to really um, develop their ability to perform at the big stage. But it's a little bit more than that because we work with apprentices to make sure they train effectively, to play around with their motivation so that we know when, because motivation goes through lulls. So we know different strategies that we can use to try to enhance motivation when it's needed. And in some cases, uh, pull back motivation when students or competitors need a bit more of a break. So what we found in our work with performance and performance psychology is that we tend to find there are similarities between these performance domains, the elite performance domains, and also the domains of education, because it's really all about an outcome. It's about learning skills to enable you to um, fulfill an outcome. And that brings me on to the, the next slide, really. And when we look at what would an ideal learner be? So we asked a number of FE educators, uh, HE educators, we looked at our training managers in world skills, and we asked them, what makes an ideal learner? What kind of attributes and what kind of behaviours does that individual demonstrate to make them an ideal learner? So in other words, what do they do to try to enhance their mindset? Now, if we look at what mindset is, Mindset is really about uh, a range of attitudes and beliefs and behaviours that we have in relation to our performance. So when we asked our training managers and educators what an ideal you know, learner's attributes may be, it was quite interesting. They came up with these different uh, aspects that are on your screen now. And they talked about focus. They talked about how students would come in and at times uh, they were unable to pay attention for as long as the educators wanted them to pay attention. We also found that they, at times they really lacked confidence. Uh, at times the educator said, yeah, I can see that when they come to their endpoint assessment, what, what they felt they were able to do, they didn't reach their potential because they weren't confident, confident in their ability to perform. They couldn't perform under pressure. And one of the main factors the educators talked about, which they felt that they would benefit from, would be being able to cope with stress, you know, managing anxiety and bouncing back from failure. So really, we're talking about uh, resilience. In psychology, there are many terms for it, resilience, grit, mental toughness, bounce back ability. But we were looking at these different aspects where learners are in an environment where we really want them to be able to not always do as well as they thought they might, but be able to learn from that. Listen to feedback and grow was also another aspect that they came back with and being able to plan and prepare. Now, these all tie in to being an ideal learner and it's about how we um, motivate people. So educators often came back to us and said, you know, I have a student who started off you know, extremely motivated. By the end or midway through the year, their motivation level had dropped off. Our and I'm not quite sure why this is happening. And in some cases, motivation, you know, start, they started off the course being hugely internally motivated. And what I mean by that is they, they used their own uh, love of completing a task or their joy of being involved in that skill. And that was their motivation. But what we found that sometimes because our system is quite outcome based, they get rewards based on how they perform. 
And by giving them rewards, it kind of detracts from their real internal love and joy of being able to do that. So the motivation changed and that it was more directed towards rewards and outcomes and beating other people rather than improving their specific uh, skill. So we found with motivation, you know, if we can try to change some of the focus from these external motivations, rewards, feedback, to more about their performance, that's when they tended to improve and their motivation increased. So what we find was there are a whole range of different factors that really influence um, a competitor or a student's ability to reach their potential. But it wasn't just one thing, it was many things interlinked together. Now, what I would like to do is rather than you know, just giving you a broad brush stroke of many of these different aspects, is I'd like to delve a little bit deeper into one. And I think probably stress is the area that is probably quite prevalent for you guys just now. And you've probably just gone through a situation where you've seen students going through some stressful situations. So stress is really, uh, it's an interesting concept, stress. And it's really how we understand stress is not actually how it developed. So if we think about what stress is and how we respond to a situation, stress is really an appraisal. Now, this is really good news. It's an appraisal, which means it's a thought process. Now, people respond to stress in so many different ways. They respond, um, they have that fight or flight response with cultural adaptations. We now add in a freeze response with stress. So I have a little activity and I'd like to know um, from your experiences, um, what does stress look like in your learning environment? Now, what I'm meaning is with your students um, heading towards endpoint assessments, what have you noticed in your learning environment? How would you be able to tell when your students are feeling stressed and perhaps not performing well? If you could just add some answers in the chat, that would be lovely. And Rachel, I'll come to you for the chat. They get annoyed and frustrated. They kind of go missing. Yeah, psychologically, they go missing. Lovely, thank you. You can see them being really frustrated. Yeah, lack of engagement is a, a, a really common aspect when people get really pre uh, pressurized. Lack of sleep, yes, that's a lovely one. It tends to be because we're worrying about the outcome or the, the actual event itself, how you're going to perform distracted in the lesson, yeah, being unable to focus, showing signs of anxiety. Yep, thank you. Any more in the chat? Let's see. And underperforming, all right, that's wonderful, thank you. So we have a whole range of different aspects there in terms of what our, our students show, <laughs> having a short fuse, absolutely. Um, and you might find that our so how we show stress is quite interesting. It's quite different to what, um, what another person might show. And if we can move on to the stress responses. So what you've just told me there, there's a whole range of stress responses. What we tend to find is that they fit, they kind of separate into two columns of stress responses. And these two areas are physiological and 
cognitive. So if we could have the list up. Um, so we have a range of these different responses. And I, I think you've covered quite a few of them there in what you see in a classroom. We see the cognitive responses, so the psychological responses that they have. Often when you're under pressure or you're feeling stressed, you're, you're not a great person to be around. You tend to be quite irritable. And as, as you said, you have a short fuse. You don't sleep very well because you're thinking about um, the situation that you need to be in. We tend to be quite forgetful. One of the, one of the really interesting cognitive responses to a stressful situation is that we tend to have really poor decision making. Sometimes in stressful situations, we do things or we decide to go down a pathway that you would never normally go down. Um, recently, in one of our centres of excellence, like excellence, we had a bricklayer and he was going through a pressure test. Now, on this pressure test, uh, he had to build um, a structure. Now, he was the top of the class. The student and the educator was expecting quite a lot from him. And when he started the pressure test, him along with about eight or nine other com uh, competitors, they started the pressure test and they found that the person, the student they thought was going to do the best, started to build it the wrong way around. So it was back to front. So he wouldn't score any points because the, the main structure, the way the, the marking system had set up was that he wouldn't score any points. But that, that was just one of those things that happens when you're, you're kind of under pressure, you're stressed, you don't notice all the things that you probably should notice. When we're under pressure, when we're, we're appraising the situation as stressful, we have a thing called a spotlight on attention. So we can pay attention to around about seven things uh, at the best of times. We can hold seven pieces of information in our heads. Obviously, there's a little bit of individual variation there. When you're under pressure, that drops down. And sometimes that drops down to two or three things that we can hold in our head. So that's why we tend to make these poor decisions, because we can't hold information in our heads because the worrying thoughts and the anxiety and the concerns about the outcome please um, so get in the way um, so what we tend to find is these decisions that we make tend to be you know decisions we would not normally do and when we talk to the bricklayer at the end he was <laughs> he couldn't believe he'd done that and he'd never done that before so that was like an example of what tends to happen when you're under pressure. The physiological responses tend to be just before the event. Cognitive tend to build up and they lead up towards it, but the physiological responses tend to be a bit more uh, related to the actual event themselves. So you might find that you have your, your shoulders go up high, you have this tension, you feel sick, you have these headaches and we tend to have different symptoms for different environments and different um, responses. But what tends to happen is together, these physiological responses and the cognitive responses, together they impact your performance. So it's really hard to perform well when you know, you're worrying or your, your thoughts are directed towards what if scenarios and you're feeling your heart racing. So these stress responses tend to impact your performance. And that leads me on to the stress appraisal model. So what we tend to find with stress. Now, as I said before, stress is an appraisal. That means it's a thought, which is a really good thing because then we can change that thought because it is just a thought. We are in charge of our thoughts. So what happens with stress is that we come along to a stressful situation. We appraise the situation. And what I mean by that is we look at how important that situation is to us. And then the second part of the appraisal is, do I have the capability or resources to be able to deal with this situation? Now, we make a, a cognitive analysis at the appraisal stage. How important is it and can I cope with it? If we go to the balanced 
side and we say, this is important, but I know I can cope with it, we have a really positive stress response and that is called eustress. If we go to the imbalance side and we go, this is really important, but I don't have the ability to cope with it, we go to distress. And distress is how we commonly think of a stress, a stress response situation. You stress is about that situation when we go to when we grow and we're in peak performance. And in the next slide, we can see that what one of our, our aims of stress and stress response is how do we change the appraisal of the stress situation? So how do we change our thinking pattern when it comes to this is important and do I have the capability to perform? So if you have a look at this little graph, if you have I direct your attention to the, the yellow lines in the middle, here is where we perform well. We need stress to perform well because stressful situations, when it's balanced, allow us to grow. So we put ourselves, and we tend to do it to ourselves, we put ourselves in these positions where you know, we're going to be stretched and we might say to ourselves, yes, this is important, I must you know, get a good mark in my endpoint assessment, but I've practised. I've spent time doing the assessment, I've simulated it, yes, I can get to the point where I can perform well. I'm confident I can do that. And that's where you get peak performance. Now, it's quite individual for different people. Some people need quite high levels of stress and some people need quite low levels of stress. And if I can just ask you in the chat, what kind of things do you do to move your students from that low level of performance. And often we find that students who are um, quite driven and quite motivated, when they're not in a situation where they're challenged, they switch off and they get distracted really easily and they go down to that green side, that inactive and bored side. So I'd be interested to know right now, what kind of things do you do to move your students from that low performance to a more optimal performance? So you've got tutorials and one-to-ones to find out their level, to find out what kind of um, what their aim is, what their goal is. Encouragement, encouragement to stay focused to help them grow. Uh, support. So remember, we're looking at this kind of healthy stress level. Mindfulness, I love that. I, I'm a big advocate for, for mindfulness. When we're talking about students who are in this green level, these are the students who don't feel challenged enough, who are in that kind of low level of healthy tension, and we want to get them up to that point of peak performance to the light green to the yellow type area. Safe competition. I love that. Competition is really important. But what we tend to find in in sport and music and dance and some of the areas that I've worked in is that when the competition is uneven or when the ability levels of students are um, uneven, what tends to happen is the individuals set goals that are either so low and so easy to achieve that they achieve these goals, but they're not stretching themselves, so they get into that green kind of inactive board phase. The other interesting part of that with competition is sometimes when you see the goals that are set in competition, and sometimes you'll have a student who'll set these really vastly unrealistic goals. And it's a similar reason for setting these lower level goals. And it's about, um, they set these really unachievable goals because nobody really expects them to be able to achieve it. And sometimes competition is a reason for that because if they say, I want to be the best in the class, well then, 
we're not really, they know they're never going to be best in the class, but if it makes it so unrealistic when they don't achieve it, nobody expected them to achieve it. So there's a wee bit of ego that they're protecting there. Um, let me just have a look at some of the other chat. Um, deliver and bring in some safe competition. Yep. Uh, deliver in different ways to encourage engagement. Yes, I'd be really interested to hear what kind of different ways you use to encourage um, that engagement process because this is probably quite a lot about what you guys do every day and it's about you know the task development, the peer responses, developing self-confidence in specific tasks rather than these generic goals. Um, so lovely, thank you. Now if we move to the other side of this graph here, if we go to the red kind of burnout side here, thank you. What we find here is that in this situation, this is often when the students have been in a situation where they think it's an extremely important outcome, but they don't feel they have the capability to continue or to cope with that situation. And this is what we think about commonly as stress. So we call that distress, but commonly we talk about that as stress. And a lot of the suggestions that you've come up with in the chat are about dealing with that distress, the anxiety, that, that appraisal of the situation as being too much. But it's really interesting to say, well, how do we move individuals back to peak performance or up to peak performance? And how do we deliver that? So I have a wee video that I would like to run for you. But before we put the video on, I'd like you just to have a think during the video. How would this apply to you in your classroom? How could you use this information in this short video to really develop understanding of stress and stress response? Video's just taking a little bit of time to load. I'll give it another couple of seconds.
Thank you, Rachel. So I'd love to know what you think about that video, what your thoughts are on that, that video, because for me, this video is a bit of a game changer. When we're looking at the stress appraisal, what we tend to find is we have these stress responses and we feel, you know, sweaty hands, we get nervous, the heart racing, and we interpret that as a negative thing. And because we interpret that as a negative thing, we think it's, a, we think it's bad and it's going to affect our performance. But if we could try to reinterpret the stress response as that means I'm ready to go, let's go with that, I can actually compete because uh, I've got sweaty palms, my heart is racing. That means I'm engaged in the task and I'm, I'm really interested in being able to perform well at that situation. So I'm interested to know if you wouldn't mind adding on to the chat, just to have a wee bit of an idea um, what you think. So I've got somebody saying, so should we create stress to help students develop? I'm not sure we should create stress. I think perhaps it's more about allowing stress to happen. If the bricklayer example, I can come up with, the educator said, I had to sit on my hands not to go over and help him because it was about, you know, he wanted to change it and fix it for him because he didn't want him to fail. You know, what we tend to find in psychology is that we have to learn to manage stress. And yes, perfect. We have to support the students to embrace stress and not not demonize it as much as we tend to do because the stress response is a strong is a response basically to get us ready for something and getting us ready for something doesn't need to be interpreted negatively are there any other comments on that Ah, uh, we teach strategies, absolutely. So this is one of the kind of first strategies um, that we might use to facilitate stress. And it really is just teaching students that this is a good thing. Now, if you look at any athlete uh, videos, any interviews of athletes before an event, they say, I'm really nervous, you know, I'm prepared, I'm excited. So it's about being able to be, change that and think, oh, I have sweaty hands. I'm concerned about the outcome of this. That means I'm really involved. I'm excited to be able to respond. So it is about being able to learn to make it a really positive tool rather than saying, I've got sweaty hands, that's terrible. It means I'm stressed, I can't perform well. And what we've found in the research is that it's a habit. You know, it's a habit of us making stress a negative thing. But habits, we can change habits because the thoughts affects our feelings and our feelings affect our behaviour. Interestingly, one of the factors that tended to make stress, a stress response interpreted in a debilitative way was a perception of not having much control. So when we have quite a lot of control over the situation, we tend to find that um, we can interpret it stress is more facilitative rather than as a negative thing. Uh, there's many interesting research articles on reinterpreting that stress response and how, how we adapt to it. And that kind of leads me on to confidence as well. Confidence and your sources of confidence are different ways that we can make the stress appraisal a bit more uh, positive. So we have to think about well, where do you get confidence from. The more confident you are, the more you have the ability to interpret you know, some concerns, being a wee bit irritable, sweaty hands, we can interpret that as a bit more positive. And your confidence comes from a variety of different areas. One other thing that is quite reasonably new in the research and we're talking about experience with adversity, and it kind of ties into one of the comments there about students experiencing stress. Now, we're not talking about trauma. We're just talking basically about how do students experience adversity? 
are things stopped for them? And if I can give you an example of, um, so in the research, we talk quite clearly about how kids come home from school sports days. And they come home from school sports days and they all have medals with you know, number one on them. So my, my child did this uh, last week. And I asked him, you know, oh, wow, so you've got number one. How did it go? Did you, did you win? And he went, no, no, everybody got one. So his learning from that, because he wasn't first, he was, he was well down the line. And that's fine. He, that's not his goal. But what we found from that is that he didn't learn that if he practices hard, he'll get better. He just learns that oh, if he does an OK job and he's there, then he gets rewarded. Now we know that when you give rewards, that tends to increase your, sorry, that decreases your motivation to continue. So when we give these rewards for not having put much effort in, we notice that they don't actually experience difficulty. So self-confidence uh, to increase levels of feelings that you can go into adversity. What we tend to, what we find also with adversity is that if the first time you experience adversity or, and what I mean by adversity is just not doing as well as you had hoped you would do. If that happens for the first time, when it's something that's really important to you, you haven't learned the tools to be able to manage adversity. If you compare someone like Steve Jobs, if you look at his tra trajectory, his career, you know, he had really had huge difficulties. He dropped out of school when he was 11. He changed schools. He dropped out of university. He was sleeping on a friend's floor. He went back into Apple, you know, founded Apple, left Apple, rejoined. He had a whole range of difficult situations that he had to deal with, but he learned to deal with difficulty. The problem sometimes comes when we have students who they don't ever deal with difficulty and they don't learn the difficult situations. They don't really know how it feels not to do well. And because they don't learn how, what, how that feels, they don't learn strategies to manage that. Um, could you just click on a couple of the, the, the bullet points there, please? Thank you. So if we, talk, if we go to the last one here, if we go to managing self-talk, and one of the most important parts of being able to manage stress is being able to tune in to what you say to yourself. So our self-talk is really important. So self-talk is about, sorry, I've just noticed a chat that's really excellent, it's interesting. It's when they say maybe each student definitely, and psychology is an art, it's um, because what I mean by that is that not one thing works for everybody in every situation. In some situations, um, they have to uh, they have to experience adversity, but then we have to teach them how to manage adversity. And you're absolutely right. Some of them would react better to having an act of break, you know, taking a break from it and come back into it. Others to meditation. And we use breathing exercises quite a lot to try to enhance um, their ability to regulate emotions. Music is used constantly to psych up, to psych down, to move away from. And we use things like imagery to help this appraisal as well. And self-talk ties into one of the strategies that we could use to try to enhance our ability to make this stress appraisal facilitative. And if I could just ask you to go to the next slide for me. Thank you. One of the interesting aspects is that when we have self-talk, we believe what we say to ourselves. And if I could just invite you to have a wee think about, you know, think about the last time you did something really well. And think about what you may have said to yourself in that situation. What we tend to find is when you do something really well, we tend to put it down to luck or somebody else not doing so well. That's why I did quite well. But when we do something really poorly, so if you can think about a situation where you didn't perform very well, or you didn't do well as well as expected, 
we tend to find that we berate ourselves. So our self-talk is more negative, you know. So we say to ourselves, when we did poorly, I'm really rubbish. I should never have tried that. You know, I don't know why I even thought I could do that. But when we do well, we tend not to do that. We don't give our, we don't blame it on ourselves. We blame it on other things. So we don't build our confidence because we often are quite negative with our self-talk. So if I could just ask, have you any examples of negative self-talk that you've heard from your students? Although it's self-talk, it's not always in our own heads and you can often hear it with your own students. So have you any examples of that? Yeah, I'm useless. I'll never be able to do that. Yep, common one. Oh, they don't have the issues that I have. Yep. So when we're talking about all the things, kind of making excuses or, I mean, very real life excuses, I'm sure in many cases, but we're kind of given a reason for us not being able to perform too much going on at the moment. Yep. And that kind of ties into the, you know, you're kind of putting it out there that you're not going to do well. I mean, regardless of, of what the situation is, but you're kind of putting it out there to not have too much expectations on you. Yep, absolutely. We won't finish properly on time yet. So there's about that, that idea that I'm not going to be able to do it. So often we tend to put that out there already. We are much harder much harder to ourselves than to other people. And I, I think if you think about what you say to yourself, you would never say the things that you say to yourself to another person. You'd never say it to a friend, to your partner. <laughs> I hope you wouldn't say it to your partner, but you would never say it um, to yourself. Yes, yeah, specifically at the learning at the, of foreign language, to say that they're not good for learning. So yeah, absolutely. We put it out there and we are quite negative to ourselves. And it's really interesting to hear some of the self-talk that comes on. Um, I've never been good at it. I can't do it. Everybody else is better than me. And we believe what we say to ourselves because it's inside our heads. And what we say to ourselves tends to affect how we feel about ourselves. And how we feel about ourselves influences the type of behaviours we show in that environment. So if we're saying to ourselves, I can't do it, I'm really stupid, it's too hard, there's too much going on, it reduces your motivation, increases your appraisal, so it makes you think, I can't cope with it. So you have a, a large stress response and that tends to influence your behaviours. You get distracted, you're disengaged, you don't want to focus or you find it really difficult to focus. We do, and we use negative reinforcement to ourselves. So when we perform, and it's this horrible cycle of stress that students get into, they, and they do compare themselves, and it's a kind of, it's a common thing that people do, although it's not a useful tool to be able to compare yourself to other people. I absolutely agree, but they often do that, and it's a comparison, and sometimes it's the comparison that makes individuals stop and say, you know, I'm not going to try because everybody else is better than me. So part of our jobs and part of my job, certainly in sport, is about, in sport, which is a hugely comparative domain, it's about focusing on them and their really specific techniques. What do they say to themselves? How can I get them to focus on a, a really specific technical aspect of their um, sport or their skill rather than pay attention to what everybody else is doing around them? All right, thank you. And if we can move on to the centering, the countering and reframing area. With self-talk and with the negative self-talk that comes out, it's really interesting to, to try and counter that and try to reframe. So I've just added some questions here that tend to be quite useful. And it ties back into confidence, sources of confidence, previous experiences. And that's how we build our, our ability to believe that we can do a task. So 
say things like, you know, what makes you think you can't do the assignment when someone says, I can't do it, I don't have enough time. So where's the evidence that you can't do the assignment? And one of the ones that I've, uh, the second one is sometimes really useful because when you have students who are saying, you know, oh, I've never, I'll never be able to do it. You know, it's too much for me. And it's about, and I think it was in the chat earlier. Well, let's look at the journey that you have been on. Have you ever felt like this before? And how did, how did that go? How did you master that? All right, so you've been able to master something that you thought was too hard before. Okay, so let's move on and try to see how, how could we master this next, next one. The one that I've written in bold has been the one that I've always found to be the most effective when, self, when negative self-talk is really critical. You know, what would you say to a close friend if they said that to you? And it's about trying to get the students to think, well, in that situation, you know, if my friend, if I, someone that I really cared about was saying that, what would I say? And if I can try to teach students or teach um, athletes to take a step back before that critical and self-talk really, you know, takes hold, then it sometimes stops and it allows that appraisal to be more positive. Okay, looking on then to the stress appraisal model, when we look at their model, if we can just click through, that would be lovely. Thank you. What we're aiming for with this stress appraisal model, so we have two areas then that we can work with students. The first one is the blue bubble that came up when we talk about how we change the appraisal. And the second one, if you could, that would be great. Thank you, Rachel. Just click through. The second bubble is about when you're in imbalance, what kind of coping strategies would you use? So when you've reached the point where it's too much, I feel stressed, this is distress, I'm worrying about it, I'm not sleeping, I can't change, you know, I can't pretend to myself that sweaty pants mean I'm ready, it means I can't do it. Where do we go with that? And if you can do two more clicks, please. How do we really think about coping strategies? So we all have natural coping strategies that we use. And some of them are effective and some of them are not. So if you could go to the next slide, please. What we tend to find is with stress, so the stress that we've been talking about tends to be more of the shorter term stress. When you've got a situation and we appraise the situation. Coping strategies are really important for us to develop effective coping strategies because when we're under this longer term stress, we have to use coping strategies that are effective. And I think earlier up in the chat, somebody mentioned you know, doing some physical activity, which is one of possibly one of the more uh, effective coping strategies to give yourself some space from the emotions associated with the stressful situation. What we tend to find, though, is if we don't have effective coping strategies, you go into this cycle of long-term stress. And you may have a student who feels unable to um, perform well and is in that period of long-term stress where they think that they're not able to achieve, they're only just getting through, and they've kind of disengaged, but actually they may be in this period of longer-term stress. What we tend to find though, that, and I'd be interested to hear your experiences, when you're in this resistance phase of stress, so that middle phase, your body's adapted, your immune system's kind of kicked in. When you have a holiday or when you have half term, this is probably the time where you've been in resistance stage for a long period of time. And when you stop, that's when you get colds, you get flus, you get respiratory problems, you get cold sores. These are all the things that happen when you've been in longer term stress. And it tends to, when you stop, your immune system just switches off because it's been fighting for so long. We tend to find that when you take a break, that's when your immune system you know, has to rest and recover. 
But what we want to aim to do is then to really try to develop some more effective coping strategies to help you manage that process. So I'd be interested to know on the next slide, what practical activities, what coping strategies do you use to support your students' mindset, to help your students manage the kind of longer term stress? Let's see what comes up. Um, oops. So any other strategies that you would use to support your students? Any coping strategies? No? Okay, if we go on to the next one, maybe this will kind of jog your memory a little. So other strategies that you could use and visit the psychologist, thanks for that. <laughs> Gamification, I'm really interested in hearing more about that. Gamification is a great distraction tool and that deals with the emotions and the um the ability for us to really um, distract and deal with the emotions. Various uh, coping strategies that you will use yourself and that you'll have seen. Um, and they, they kind of tend to cluster into different areas. They cluster into really approaching the problem or trying to avoid the problem. So we find things like we use um, wishful thinking or we vent, we use social support to vent. We use physical activity, as you guys have said. We try to use some positive self-talk, goal setting, time management. Now, the interesting part of coping strategies is that we can make them more effective, but we can use different coping strategies at different times. So if you could just go through two slides for me, please, Rachel, just to the, the practical activities. Just kind of thank you. So what we use with our competitors and with our apprentices is we use breathing techniques. And breathing technique is just a strategy that we use. It's really to and um, slow things down. And I think it's been mentioned before on the chat, we might use diaphragmatic breathing, and it's just a really short technique that requires practice for individuals to take a step back from that um, situation and be able to regularly slow things down. Progressive muscular relaxation is another technique that we use quite regularly. And that's about feeling the difference between tension and relaxation. Imagery is a hugely useful tool. We use imagery for a whole range of things. We use it to image ourselves coping with stress. We use it to image ourselves preparing and planning and going through different situations. We use imagery to manage stress. So if you're interested in imagery and using imagery with your students, uh, I would highly recommend it. And there's lots of different resources that we can provide at the end um, that could help develop imagery and mindfulness, of course. Um, if we have any, any aspects of being in the present rather than being in this automatic pilot or being caught up in the, the stress and the stress response, then we tend to find that works really well with students. So what I would like to do then is just give you a couple of takeaway messages because we've gone through quite a lot of information relatively uh, briefly. So my takeaway messages from this uh, short session would be that to try to remember that stress can be really positive. Uh, it can be about growth and without stress, without you stress, we tend not to reach growth and development. So teaching students that these stress responses that we tend to have, they can be really positive. Another takeaway message would be that um, recognizing how to, where our sources of confidence come from, where that can come from, and recognizing self-talk and setting up some 
questions to try to maybe reframe some of the self-talk and enhance your ability to appraise the situation as a more positive mechanism. Coping strategies can also be really effective because um, we want to manage the distress, but I think it's really important to state now that coping strategies um, need practice. So if you're using any of these practical activities like breathing, progressive muscular relaxation, imagery, mindfulness, that's just a short list. If you're using any of these, then the aim is to practice before pressure and stress comes, and then you can use them in a stressful situation. So if I can come to the last couple of minutes, and just interested if you have any questions about anything that we've covered today. So I'm really happy to answer any questions on the work that we do at World Skills or on any of the information that we've talked about today. So any questions? Hello, just before we move on to the questions section, I'm just going to launch another poll. Um, if you can just let us know how useful you found today's session, that would be brilliant. Thank you, everything's come in. And we have over 70% found it very uh, extremely useful and 46% very useful. So thank you very much for that. Now, please just use the um, chat box if you've got any questions um, while we've got Dr. Steph here. I could just see a little question come up there with them. Um, what further further reading could you point us to? Um, I would suggest that you speak to the curriculum development team or the account executive, um, because there, there are so many resources, but I would like to direct you more towards the evidence-based resources if possible. So I can certainly make them available to the account execs and the curriculum development managers. If, if that's of interest to you, Scream Therapy, I'm interested in that. We'd love to have that material to help students, absolutely. And I, I definitely, the Centre of Excellence um, with World Skills, we've really developed that understanding of, you know, how do we tie into mindset? Because we know it's hugely important. So any material we can give you and anything that might help, I would be very happy to hand over. Uh, how can we help students with the stress that generates them learning through the virtual reality. Yeah, when they have classes, it's something that they don't like at all. Yes, I absolutely agree. And what we are finding in psychology as well, that that lack of social connection is really influencing their moods and thoughts and emotions. I think the more we can have some kind of social connection, the better these classes tend to be. And it's, it's not, a, not an easy solution because what sometimes happens is that the students come on and the first day they have screens on and then cameras go off. So I've t we've tended to use things like you know, breakout rooms where screens must be on and they have to converse with another student because it's the social connection that they are finding that is the, the real struggle with these classes and these situations. So it's about trying to, any way that we can develop any type of social connection um, tends to help. It, it's, a really, it's a really great question and I'm sorry, I don't think I have a great answer for it, but social connection is good. Uh, how can teachers manage their stress? Yes, I think we could probably do a whole other session on that and we could do a session on different coping strategies because I think this year probably um, has been an extremely stressful year for teachers and I would be surprised if when they finish they're not in that situation where they instantly have these kind of colds and flus and stuff because their immune system is recovering. So yes, it'd be great to run another session on that. Uh, 
is there any research into the impact of mindfulness? Um, yes, in sport and exercise with mindfulness, and there isn't so much in education yet, but mindfulness, so there's two kind of main programs at the moment, the mindfulness-based stress reduction model and the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Now, the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy developed from Oxford University, and with that, um, be, that has been a, a really important aspect in sports that we've used, and it has enhanced, I mean, the research is really clear that when you have individuals who practice mindfulness, that really enhances performance because they manage to stay in the moment and not get caught up in the thoughts. But I think education will be, um, will be next in the research. So although there isn't much just now, uh, I, I would keep your eyes peeled because I think that is a, a, a new field of research. Would you advise us to assess stress levels somehow? Um, not particularly because stress is really different for everybody. It's a really idiosyncratic thing. And because it's individual, one person might thrive on these higher feelings of stress and one person may only just be surviving on these lower levels of stress. So when you assess it, we kind of get this standardized, you probably get that kind of inverted U-shaped curve of you know, people's responses. So I'm not sure that it would be a hugely useful tool. What is more useful is, is your, your relationship with the student and recognizing when things are changing for them. But in a virtual reality world, that's not always the easiest. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. I think that's the end of the questions. I just want to say a quick thank you so much um, for your questions and your feedback on that. It's been really interesting. Thank you. No, we're going to have to say goodbye now. Thank you all so much for attending and participating in this session today. Please take a minute to complete our evaluation as you do log out. Your feedback and ideas will help us develop our CPD offer. If you require any further information regarding today's session, please contact your account execs or your curriculum officers. And I would like to say goodbye. And from everyone at NCFE and WorldSkills UK, please stay safe and we look forward to working with you again soon.